ladies and gentlemen, let's read Gaming Titicum video. Let us discuss the profits of indie game developers and developers as a whole. Now, we're not talking studios here. Instead, we focus primarily on the individuals, the salaries. Now, definitely, when it comes to the gaming industry, I think we as consumers, but certainly those who are studying, definitely have almost a romanticized notion of the profits that are expected and i think this is primarily due to games such as like minecraft taking off and the call of duties and so on and so on and these titles of course massively distort the figures so gamma sutra that's g-a-m-a -A, sutra that's s-u-t-r-a they did a survey um which basically was asking how much do you make to individuals now how they've basically done this is 6.5% of people were disqualified because their income was not directly um, proportional to the games industry. They were getting it from other sources. So maybe they were doing, say, indie development on the side, whatever. They also removed people who were getting less than 10,000 United States dollars. And also the highest salary range was limited to 200,000 US dollars. Because a few very limited number of people from the games development industry, you know, the really, really, really influential people, they are going to distort the figures. And so, obviously, if you go to someone who is, like, really world famous and they're incredibly well known in the industry and they are incredibly influential, they're definitely going to distort the figures compared to, like, the average studio or what's realistic for people to earn. So as I said, this basically means you've got to be between 10,000 US dollars, 200,000 US dollars. It's not a side job. You don't have a side job. Your primary income, your only income is going to be from game development. And so this means we have some very interesting figures. So this is comparison to 2013. The game developers in the United States average salary was 8,000, was 83,060. So this is slightly down compared to 2013, which was 84,337. So it's basically gone down a smidgen over $1,000 a year, which isn't massive. It's, you know, pretty respectable. Um, meanwhile, programmers, game programmers, are continuing to be very influential. The average salary in 2013 was 93,251. Now, um, in 2012, it was 92,151. So it's gone up about $1,000 in 2013. Meanwhile, the artists, the visual artists, on average in the United States um, in 2013 made $74,349. That's down from $75,009 from the year previous to that, so in other words, 2012. Designers, on the other hand, which is definitely the most romanticized career of paths, I mean, that's the one that everyone aspires to be, or a lot of people aspire to be. Everyone wants to be that person who is associated with, let's say, the next Metal Gear Solid, the next Sonic. They want to be the next Mario creator and so on. They want to be that person, right? It's, you know, it's nice to make a visual style, but at the same time, the actual designing of a game and so on is definitely the biggest one. So anyway, that on average, a salaried US-based game designer made 73864 in uh, 2013, which is actually down from 75065 in 2012. Meanwhile, if you're a game designer with three years experience or less, the average salary in 2013 was 50,625 US dollars, which was down substantially. It was almost down about 10%. It was 55,313 the year previous to that. So that's pretty impressive. On the other hand, if you're a solo indie developer, the average income in 2013 was $11,812. That's down a staggering 49% from 2012. 
where they would make around $23,130. Now, here's the part that's actually quite disgusting. 57% of indie game developers, including both solo indies and, min and members of indie teams, made under $500 US dollars on sales. On the other end of the spectrum, 2% of indie developers made over 200,000 US dollars. So what this means is that on average, salaries in general are pretty much at best holding steady. But if you're an indie developer, you're either going to make it big, um, we're talking like really big, or there's a possibility that you're going to be making literally pennies um, in your hard work. And when you consider just how much work this is uh, to develop a game, I mean, even audio professionals, it's not like audio professionals are doing extremely well. They are actually quite well paid. Um, they're getting like 95682 as an average. QA testers, 54833 average, and so on and so forth and so forth. And it also depends, by the way, on the based on the region. Um, so, for example, uh, this is just a pure example. Um, if you're a programmer in the east of the United States, you're going to be getting paid almost eighty-five thousand US dollars. On the other hand, if you're in the west, it's almost a hundred k. So, there's a lot here to be um, thought of, because similarly, audio professionals, you get paid fifty-eight thousand five hundred in the east. Meanwhile, you get 112,000 in the West. So this is definitely something to bear in mind. And when you start also taking into account, say, businesses and management people and so on and so on and so on, you could see what the deal is with games development. Games are becoming increasingly expensive to produce and develop and manage. There was a time when indie development was definitely romanticized it was the pure path to many people and a lot of developers a lot of small developers were making great money from it now not so much it's not that it's impossible it's not that you're bro going to be broke if you're an indie but for all of the big successes for all of the limbos for all of the um, outlasts for all of the Minecrafts and Terrarias and all the other games that make them like way onto Steam, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting tons of money. And even mobile games now, where they make free to play titles with, say, ad revenue, the bottom line is you're dealing with a lot of competition. It's not just a case of only one or two people who are doing this, especially now that game engines are becoming increasingly easy to work with. So publishing and creating a game is becoming a lot worse. And this is a problem. This is why so many people foresee another video game crash. And I'm not going to doom and gloom you. I'm not going to tell you that we are in a doomsday scenario. But the bottom line is, despite the fact that I, like you, probably criticise Electronic Arts, I, like you, probably criticise Activision and Ubisoft for often going the safe way for games. And we are those people, most likely, who say, really? Another corridor shooter? Really? You couldn't have added a female character? Really? And so on and so forth. But the bottom line is, to be honest, with so much investment, you almost can't blame them. I, I said almost. That's the problem. Um, it's it's becoming extremely expensive. If you have a flop, I'm just for example, Crytek. They they are an awesome company. Their technology is incredibly impressive, the CryEngine. But unfortunately, it was just slightly underwhelming at E3, and we know the problems they had with like, for example, Rise, Son of Rome. It just didn't sell as well as they'd hoped. Crisis Free, same thing. Um, it didn't sell quite as well as I'd hoped. In my personal opinion, it would have probably been a good idea for them to have waited until next generation consoles and then released Crisis Free then. 
um, because I personally think that the next generation consoles would have benefited far more from it. But obviously Crisis 3 was released quite some time ago now and it would have been quite difficult for them to have to do that. It's it's a whole timing situation. And as I said, games are becoming increasingly expensive. You get situations now where, yes, audio processors can handle ridiculous amounts of samples on screen. Yes, graphics processors on screen, on speakers. Yes, you've got situations where graphics processors now can handle millions and millions and millions of different colors on screen and screaming around at ridiculously high frame rates and all of that jazz. But the bottom line is, some poor little fella has to actually design this stuff. And it takes time. Um, but that's just kind of how it is. And so... There is definitely that romanticized notion, as I've said a couple of times now, with indie development. And it's great. You know, indie games can be incredibly good. And indie, don't forget, encapsulates a huge, huge, huge market now. I mean, some people would point out that Stoic are indie developers, technically. You could argue Notch is an indie developer. But, let's face it, they've got a little bit of capital behind them now. On the other hand, Indy can also be, you know, your friend Tom, who happens to be working in his, you know, bedroom or his garage with his, you know, friend Billy, and they're trying to design the game, they're trying to do the audio, they're trying to do the graphics, they're trying to do everything themselves. And oftentimes... I mean, I've spoken to indies, I know a couple of indie developers and so on, and it's often the case where they'll try and do favours for each other, you know, they'll try and get um, their friend or a friend of a friend to create some audio so they can put that in their resume or whatever. You know, for example, let's say you're, you're, um, tr you want to be an audio professional in the gaming industry, you might create some audio for this dude's game. It might even be for free or a ridiculously low rate simply so that you can get stuff on your resume so that someone in the future will be like, I like that. And it's a whole thing. Um, and that's the problem. So once again, this is not a doom and gloom video. This is just to try and highlight that despite the fact that we have this notion that everyone in the industry, or I wouldn't say we, is in everyone, but quite a few of us have this notion that if you're an indie developer, you're making money. You automatically associate, or at least many people associate, indie with Notch. Indie with The Last of Up. Uh, the Last of Us, sorry, Outlast, you associate with Terraria, you associate it with those games like Amnesia, the ones that just sell incredibly well because of the YouTube phenomenon. And this is another thing as well. This is, remember the indie, uh, you get games like Goat Simulator or Surgeon Simulator, which of course try to encapsulate and ride on YouTube popularity from the big YouTubers, the big Let's Players, because, you know, they release it, it becomes almost like as many people call it, YouTube fodder. And they do that, of course, to try and promote the sales of the game so that effectively it becomes almost like the almost like a symbiotic relationship between the YouTube Let's Player and the, the game industry. But that, that, my friends, is a subject that is extremely, extremely lengthy and one that is not going to be included in this video because it will probably start me on a rant that will last until you are long um, bored. Anyway, I'll see you soon. Take care and bye for now.